Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar this morning. Uh, today's webinar is on Azure Virtual Desktop, um, so something that's really, really quite exciting for us um, as a managed service provider, and hopefully something that's exciting for you um, as, as end users and businesses as well. Um, on the webinar today, um, you know, we're going to do things a little bit differently. So for those of you who have joined me on previous webinars, thank you for coming back for another session. And for those of you who are new to it as well, um, we do have all of our webinars on our YouTube channel, which we can uh, share with you later. But we are doing things slightly differently today. I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Andrew Williamson, who is a senior support specialist here at Dynamic Edge and a real expert in this area of Azure Virtual Desktop. I'm going to run you through a short presentation. I'm just going to give you an idea of, of what is Azure Virtual Desktop and, and where do we position it in, in, in technology. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to Andrew for a live demonstration, which is really quite exciting. So to be able to show you a bit of the background of Azure Virtual Desktop, and I will explain more about that as we go through. So a um, few quick slides uh, just to run you, run you through. So we do have evolving needs when it comes to end user computing. So this is the you and I when we're using our desktops and we're using our, our connecting to, to our desktop environment. These needs are absolutely evolving and they're evolving for various different reasons. If we look at the first one, they are distributed employees. I mean, goodness gracious, over the last 18 months, that really has become such an important factor for us. So remote working. Remote working, so through the pandemic, we've had to adjust and be able to work remotely and, and, and really to be able to work from wherever we are. We also have policies in place within our businesses now about bring your own device. So, you know, it's a case of what, what, are, you, what are you most comfortable with using? If you're a Mac user or you're a PC user, it depends. It doesn't matter what device you want to use. You can use your own device to connect to your work platform. There are field roles and also we also, as businesses, we have various branch locations. And so we might have places dotted throughout the country, but we need everybody to be on the same environment. Um, security and regulation, it's a hugely important. OK, so we've got industry standards that we need to, 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 to follow. There's government regulations, perhaps if, if we are governed um, by the government there, we have the regulations that we need to follow there. There's also our IP security that we, we need to take care of. And really importantly, our customer data. Um, it is so important that we keep our customer data safe and secure in an environment that, 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 that they can trust as well as ourselves. We also have an elastic work for, workforce now. So what I mean by elastic workforce is, is as a business, you might be looking at opportunities around mergers and acquisitions. So if we do grow our business and perhaps we grow our business quite quickly, we need the end user computing, the computing that our, 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 our staff and, and colleagues use, that needs to be able to expand nice and quickly as well in order to be able to welcome in new employees or new businesses into our group. Perhaps in our business, we're, we're short term and seasonal. So, for example, coming into if, if we think, you know, I, I'm, I'm based in Scotland, so, you know, hopefully we're getting very close to, to a ski season uh, coming up very, very soon. So these businesses within the ski season environment, they, they are seasonal, so they will be ramping up the amount of employees that they have at this particular time of year. So we need to have um, end user computing that can scale and be flexible um, to support those needs. And also within our businesses, we might have a contractor and partner that require access into our systems as well. And then for a lot of businesses, we've got specialised workforces and uh, work workloads. So if you think within your organisation, you might have a line of business application and that line of business application is the lifeblood of your of, 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 of your um, your business. If you look at the photograph I've got there, that certainly looks like a, a manufacturing, a food manufacturing area. So the line of business application there is so important to the operation of that business. So again, we need that line of business application to be scalable and to be used by employees across the board. It is really important that we focus on customer service, that we keep our customers happy. So again, we need access to the systems that we need um, in order to keep customer service at the highest level. And also, if, if you think about, I've just used an example there of design workstations. So I do know that we've, we've got some um, people in the webinar today that have a design background, their, their business is a design background. So we think about design workstations, these have to be high powered devices. So we could, you know, we can actually now look at how, what can we do in the cloud in order to provide that design workstation environment. So some of the common challenges that we see around end user computing. OK, so employee experience and impact on productivity. If your end user computing is not up to standard, the employee experience is going to be low. So again, if we look into to the, the workforce of the future and we are trying to attract, you know, 
bright people into our organization, people that, that can help take us forward, you know, graduates coming into our organization as well. We want to give them an excellent experience and the IT that they use is part of that experience. Of course, our culture as a business is important, but the computing that we give them is really, really important. And that obviously will have an impact on their productivity if it's not up to scratch. I've mentioned it again, data security and compliance concerns. This is a concern for every single business. You only have to look at the news every single day to hear about another type of data breach that has happened um, out there in the industry. So data security is a challenge that you know, we really need to be thinking about all the time. VPN and data centre capacity. So for those businesses who, who perhaps weren't that flexible during the pandemic and they had to go into environments where they were using virtual private networks and, and, and things like that, you will have had issues with that. I can almost guarantee it. So where the VPN maybe comes down and that there's maybe not that connectivity. These are things that we've had to deal with through time. And then perhaps also we've got a data centre. So we're, we're using servers within a data centre. Perhaps that's on site or it might be hosted somewhere else, but there's capacity and performance issues off those data centres as well. So again, a common challenge. And then probably for some people, if there's anyone from, from accounts or finance on the call today, budget, that's a huge thing. OK, so when we think about end user computing, we need to think about our budget. and How do we plan going forward for the technology that we require um, with our, our end user computing? So what we're going to look at today is a bit around cloud solutions for end user computing. OK, so that's why we're here. Azure Virtual Desktop it is a cloud solution for end user computing. We can access a secure desktop experience from virtually anywhere. And when I mean virtually anywhere, it, does, it just doesn't matter. If you've got a device, if you've got a way to contact the internet and you've got that internet connection, you have got the ability to access your desktop. So we can deliver desktop experiences virtually anywhere. We can build in intelligent security and Flandre will come through some of these points later on in the demonstration. We've got the cloud scale and agility. So if, if you know anything about the cloud now, it's about that ability for us to scale up and scale down. OK, so we think about Microsoft 365. There are plenty of webinars on that in the past. Think about Microsoft 365, an absolute cloud solution there that, for our businesses. And if you just look at email as an example, so we have a new employee that comes on board with the business. We just go to that cloud solution. Which is, which is Microsoft 365, and we add a mailbox, and the mailbox is instantly there for you. So we can scale as a business with cloud solutions. And also, and really importantly, we've got flexible pricing options that are available now through, through cloud solutions. So end user computing choices. OK, so we do have a couple of choices that we can do when we look at cloud-based um, end user computing. But first of all, we'll go down to the bottom there. OK, so then at the bottom on the left hand side, we've got PCs or mobile. OK, so this is your, your, your laptop device that you would use and perhaps you're just using the local desktop and that's where you that's where you do your work. So you've got the power of just your machine, just the PC that you're using. Bottom right hand side, we've got on prem VDI. So that would be something like if we just go back in time a little bit, so remote desktop services. OK, so a remote desktop solution or terminal services, depending on what, what, what you know it as. But that would be your server estate that's sitting in your in your office environment and you've got the ability to allow people to have a remote desktop from your server environment. But what we want to do now is take that to the next level. We want to take that to, to the cloud, OK, and working in cloud, um, cloud based end user services. So we've got the two options there as well. We can have a cloud PC. I'm going to go through that in a little bit of detail just to give you what the other options are that are around there. But also more importantly, in the, the, the direction that we're going today is looking at this um, cloud VDI. So looking at Azure Virtual Desktop, which is which is basically a cloud based desktop environment for your entire organization. So the cloud solutions that are available to you, there are a couple of options here and I did say I would go through um, what, what options are there. On the left hand side there we've got Cloud PC, Windows 365, that's what it's called. So if you have a look at Windows 365 online, you'll be able to see that. Now for, for, for businesses, for smaller businesses, um, Windows uh, Cloud PC through Windows 365 might be absolutely perfect for you. We're not going to go into too much detail on Windows 365 today, but if it is something you would like to talk about, absolutely give us a call and um, drop us an email, drop us a message, and we can certainly pick up a conversation on that. So with the, the Windows 365 Cloud PC, this would give you an individual desktop environment in the cloud. And the main benefit of that, I guess, is that you don't need to necessarily have the high powered device in order to go about your day to day business because your desktop environment is held within the cloud. So it is a complete software as a service um, that is securely streams your personalized Windows desktop app settings and content from the Microsoft Cloud to any device. You could pick up your desktop from a tablet just as an example. Come across to the right hand side and really what we're here to talk about today is Azure Virtual Desktop. So it's a cloud VDI platform that delivers hosted desktops and apps with really importantly 
maximum flexibility. And that's really what we're driving in on today is about the flexibility for you as a business to grow and to scale and to adjust um, and be as agile as possible. So we, you've got to pick the right technology for your needs. And as I said before, if you are a smaller business, perhaps the Windows 365 environment would be would be more useful for you. So we'll just go through a few of the key points for, for those. So the Windows 365 is optimised for simplicity. It's going to give you a Windows 10 or a Windows 11, and I've put in brackets there soon. But as Andrew showed me um, earlier on this week, Windows 11 is now available within the Azure Virtual Desktop environment, which is really quite exciting. So it's complete end-to-end -end Microsoft services, one-stop administration and Microsoft Endpoint Manager, and direct self-service model. So you can look after it yourself. Your Windows 365 environment, you can look after that yourself. And it's very predictable per user pricing. Per user pricing means I know exactly what my desktop is going to cost me on a monthly basis. Again, for the smaller side of things, you know, just a few users using that. So we go across to Azure Virtual Desktop and the main reason that we're here today. So again, I'm using that flexibility word is optimized to allow our business to grow and scale as required. So Windows 10 and Windows 11 operating environments are available there or Windows Server multi-session desktops if required. Remote app streaming, okay, so let's take this just for a second. So we might have, a we, we talked about the line of business application earlier on. So we might not want to give people an entire desktop environment to use in the cloud. We might just want to put an application in the cloud and allow people just to access that single application which is hosted in the cloud. So remote app streaming allows that application to sit in the cloud and people to connect to it from their device, from, from their local desktop to, to that application which is running within the Azure Virtual Desktop environment. So another key differentiator there. We've got full control over configuration and management. We also do have Citrix and VMware support within there as well. We're not going to go into a significant amount of detail about that today. But again, if you would like to talk about that a bit further, please do get in touch. And flexible uh, consumption based pricing. Okay, flexibility being the key word in there. OK, so it depends on how much you need, what you use. So if we go back to, to businesses, perhaps that, that do scale the workforce, if you're seasonal, things like this, you can then actually say, well, I know that my end, end user computing is going to cost me more in these certain months because I'm scaling up. But I know that I can scale that back down, importantly, when that isn't required. So selecting the right solution for you. We talked about Windows 365 um, there to the left, and we also talked uh, very briefly about Azure Virtual Desktop with Citrix and VMware, but really want to focus in today on the Azure Virtual Desktop. That is really what we're here to talk about today. So I'm just gonna quickly run through these bullet points just to get these, these key points over before we, we go into the live demonstration. So Azure Virtual Desktop will give you that flexibility and control. OK, we know that we've got this desktop environment in the cloud that we can apply to any employee, regardless of their location and and also be able to scale it up nice and quickly and scale it back down just just as quickly as required. We've got multi session Windows virtual machines. OK, so we can have various multi sessions going on at the same time there. Andrew will go a bit more into detail on that. Data residency and geo requirements. OK, so within GDPR, we want to know that um, our data is held within the UK. Um, as an example, so we can choose the Microsoft data center where your data is held. We can then also have the, the, the disaster recovery aspect of that, so across different geographies as well. So we could use UK South, we could use UK West, and we can have that all set up. So it gives us the ability to define what we want to do there. I talked about remote app streaming. I think that's really important, certainly for businesses that have any line of business application that really um, you know, is the lifeblood of, of their business. Um, specialized GPU and high performance computing workloads. OK, so it is again, if we go back to that design story. So if you're a business that works in design, you've got CAD drawings and you've got various different things like the large files um, the, the Azure Virtual Desktop is the ideal environment for you if you want to have that cloud based desktop environment and scalable compute and storage to optimize uh, for cost and experience. Again, I talked about that in the last slide just to reemphasize that point. You know, you can really start to predict for your business what your compute costs are going to be um, across the year, depending on the size and scale on, and, 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 and what you're doing there. So another few little points on, on AVD, um, just before we, we hand over to, to Andrew for the demonstration side of things. So we can deliver the only multi-session Windows 10 experience and 
Windows 11, which is now just sitting around the corner and is available for us to start trialing. Enable optimizations for Microsoft 365 apps. OK, so if we think about Microsoft 365, and again, I would I would ask you if you've not seen any of our, our webinars in the past about uh, about Microsoft 365 and, and all the various different applications within there, please do go back and, and have a look at those. And um, we'll have more coming in the future as well, but we can really optimize those applications within the, the Azure Virtual Desktop. We think about collaboration as a key. Microsoft Teams is a key. And one of the problems, I guess, we've always seen with, with the older solutions. So if you look about RDS solutions, Microsoft Teams takes up a huge amount of resource within an RDS environment. And so therefore, and I've seen experience of this before, where we've had to disable Microsoft Teams within an RDS environment. That's not ideal because Microsoft Teams is, is absolutely the center of, of our collaboration and communication within our businesses. So within the Azure Virtual Desktop environment, we've got the ability to optimize these applications and really get the most out of them. We can stream apps to deliver software as a service solutions to your employees and customers, and we can deploy and scale in minutes. OK, so I'm going to actually set Andrew up at this point here who's going to do the, the demonstration for you. He was sharing with me what he was going to demonstrate. And this deploy and scale in minutes, hopefully, um, is going to actually really become real life for you just as we go through that demonstration, um, which we're going to be heading across to just shortly. So as I said, um, there is a live demonstration that we're, we're, we're going to be doing. OK, so um, what we've asked Andrew to do is to show you a couple of different stages of the Azure Virtual Desktop environment. I'm very aware that there may be people on the call today on the webinar today who are from a very technical background. So the administration of Azure Virtual Desktop will be of, of significant interest for you. So some of the things that Andrew is going to demonstrate later on might be quite technical. OK, so please bear with it. If you are from a technical background, you'll find this very interesting. If you're not from a technical background, what you should really be watching for in here is the simplicity, is the ability to do these things nice and quickly for us to be able to scale your business really, really quickly for you to be able to come and, and us to look at the demands that are happening on your end user computing and the ability to move these things along nice and quickly and, and, and scale with flexibility. We also what we want to do is look at the end user experience because that's really, really important. You know, if we go back to the top of my slide deck there, we were talking about some of the, 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 the concerns that we have and it's about that end user experience. So we want our end users to have a slick experience. So Andrew's going to show you a, a bit through that. And then also a bit about the reporting and the metrics that are involved with Azure Virtual Desktop as well. So that is the end of my presentation. And um, what I would like to do now is just introduce to you my colleague Andrew Williamson. Andrew, as I said earlier on, is um, senior support specialist at Dynamic Edge, and um, he's hugely involved in um, this environment, and um, is now going to take you through um, what Azure Virtual Desktop is. So, Andrew, over to you. Uh, good morning, all. Hopefully, you can all hear me okay. Uh, thanks, Stephen. <clears throat> Um, OK, so yeah, as Stephen said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just take you through Azure Virtual Desktop, how it looks, how we configure it, and then I'll go into some of the details about what goes on. Um, so hopefully you can all see my screen. Um, here we're in a dynamic, de <coughs> excuse me, dynamic edge dev and test environment. You have to excuse me, by the way, I'm getting over a cold, <coughs> so I'm probably going to be coughing a fair bit. Here we have a basic tenant set up in Azure where the only infrastructure we have running is a domain controller. Now, I'm just going to jump straight into creating an Azure virtual desktop pool here. We're going to blaze through this because this is going to take a wee while for it to actually run, but then we're going to go back and talk about some of the stuff. So I'm just going to start off with this demonstration as we configure a, a virtual desktop pool. So at the moment, we're starting with not much more than a server that has all your identities on it. Now, a lot of you will have this already. Um, so that's not really a big deal to sort of, you know, to go from there. So we're just going to create a host pool and I'll explain more about what host pools are and stuff in a minute. I, I just want to kick this off because it's going to take time and do things in the background. Don't worry too much about what you're seeing on screen here and, you know, what's a resource group and what's the host pool name. We'll go over some of that in a minute. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to pick a place to put my pool and we're just going to call it AVD Demo Thursday. And we're going to lock the pool in the UK region. And we're going to create a pooled environment. <clears throat> now, again, I'll go over what most of these are in a minute, but basically the pool type, you can have personal, which is where everyone gets their own machine. You wouldn't have a multi-user environment for that. Or you can have pooled, which is more like a traditional, tra <coughs> excuse me, a traditional terminal services environment where users share machines. So for this, we're just going to select pooled. And again, I'll go over all these in a while, but um, we can have different ways to balance the pool. 
So we can have what's called breadth first scaling and depth first. So breadth first, if we have say 50 users and we've decided that 10 machines can handle 10 users each. So, hang on, do we need that? <laughs> Five machines can handle 10 users each for 50 users. So if we do breadth first, what happens is the first user goes onto the first machine, the second user goes onto the second, third to third, fourth to fourth. The sixth user goes back onto the first machine. So now the first machine has user one and six, the next machine gets user two and seven, that kind of thing. If you change it to depth scaling, what happens is we can handle, I think I said five users per machine. So users one to five go onto the first machine, users two, uh, six to 10 go onto the second machine, stuff like that. And we can specify a limit in terms of how many we want. Now, the reason we, we choose the right load balancing algorithm is how do we want to achieve our cost savings the best? If we have five machines in the pool, chances are, come half past eight in the morning, we're not gonna need all those machines spun up because not everybody's in and working. So with Azure Virtual Desktop, as Stephen said, you pay on consumption, you pay for usage. So if you have five machines in the pool, but you don't need them, for example, maybe half the office is on holiday, it's the school holidays, uh, or again, maybe it's just early, some, you know, a few people come in at eight o'clock, more people perhaps, you know, come in at 10 o'clock, maybe they're staggered hours. There's no point in starting all these machines and having them spin there. So what we're really tending to recommend these days is a depth first scaling model. So what that does is it loads everybody onto the first machine and then when that machine's full, it starts a new one on demand. And this is a great way to sort of achieve uh, savings. What we can also do is during the day with various automations is look for machines that have spun up, maybe because a user requested them or, or required it rather. They then logged off, maybe they're on a half day or something and the machine is now sitting there idle. So we have automations that will then go around and do a bit of tidying and oh, there's nobody on this machine, I'll just shut it down and then that saves more money. <clears throat> so this is your basic configuration for a pool, what type you want. So here we're going for pooled, as we said, so we're going to have users going on to it. We're going to have depth first and we're going to have a maximum of five users. That's what we've decided that for our specification of machine, we can comfortably support on these on these uh, virtual machines. So we're going to add some virtual machines <coughs> and we're going to give them a name. <coughs> so we're just going to call it AVD host. And we're not going to have any infrastructure redundancy. We can talk about that in a while. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting. So here are the off the shelf images that you can pick for when you're going for Azure Virtual Desktop. And you'll see from this list, there's only one mention of a server enterprise, a server operating system there. The rest is all Windows 10 and now nice and new Windows 11. Um, that's generally your preference for Azure Virtual Desktop. You can use server 2019 but it's more expensive because you have to pay for a terminal what's called a terminal terminal services cal which is a client access license you have to pay for the server it's a bit more expensive when you use windows 10 and windows 11 that's all covered in your office 365 business premium for example you're not actually paying for the operating system license so there's a bit of a saving in there <coughs> but typically these lists these operating system images aren't actually much used to what we would do because nobody runs their business entirely on Word and Excel and, and Outlook. Everybody's got their own customizations. Some people need AutoCAD, some people need Photoshop, some people use Visual Studio, some use Pegasus, Sage, you name it. All the customizations go in there. We'll talk about the customization process in a bit, but for the moment, for a demonstration, just to set up Azure Virtual Desktop, we'll just pick Windows 11 with 365. So we decide what specification of machine we would like to have. Now, this is a pretty basic one. Uh, you can see there are all manner of different classes here, and these are the columns that we're interested in, the number of CPUs and the number of the amount of memory. Uh, this is what critically, these are the most influencing factors in, in, in terms of Azure Virtual Desktop and maintaining some level of performance. And we're going to create the pool with this, but if we decide that that we've chosen wrongly, basically, because we never know until a user until and so until an organization starts using a system in anger, we don't know exactly what the best fit will be. There, there are sizing guidelines, but we found they're not that great. And I'm gonna come on later on, and I'm gonna show you some slides where we actually have some performance monitoring statistics, where I show that we have one organization has about 40 users on five hosts. Another organization has 60 users on four hosts, and they're exactly the same specification hosts. They just work differently. So, <coughs> excuse me. So the sizing thing is totally flexible. You're never committed to the size. That's not a problem for you to say, oh, I've picked this one. 
that was wrong. I wish I'd gone for a larger one. You just resize it and it takes minutes. And even if you want to burn the whole thing and start again, <laughs> that's also pretty easy. You know, the, the time it's going to take me to set this up is, you know, it's next to nothing. So this is a common size that's used for Azure Virtual Desktop. It's in the D class, and as it says there, it's a general purpose machine. So that's what we're going to pick. A number of VMs, we'll just go for one. <coughs> we'll just start off with that. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I was really hoping that coughing would stop for this. So we're just going to connect it to network. And we're going into the production one, and we're not going to bother a security group. Now, Active Directory. This is what I was saying earlier on as a prerequisite, but you'll notice there it also says Azure Active Directory. So this is a very new feature. And just like everything in Azure, Azure Virtual Desktop is constantly under development. Um, when Azure Virtual Desktop came out, it was a prerequisite. You had to have an Azure, uh, sorry, an Active Directory because it joined the domain and you needed that to access your file shares that perhaps you might have moved over. Uh, it was just a, it's just a prerequisite, basically. But now you can do it with Azure Active Directory only, which is kind of handy. But there's a lot of limitations with that still that Microsoft are working hard to remove. So at the moment, we can almost forget about Azure Active Directory. It's getting there and it will be there soon. But at the moment, we need Active Directory. So <clears throat> as, as I said here earlier on, the virtual machines I have, I have a domain controller running. So I'm going to join my domain and that domain, if you have an on-premise direct, uh, Active Directory server, it's, that's what you're, you know, what you're connecting it to. So, you know, you're the company.com server, the one that you log into in the morning, that's what that would be. So this would be an add that. I'm not going to specify, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to specify that. I'm sure I did that yesterday when I was testing this out and it just got me there. So. This is just a few credentials. If it's going to fail at all doing this, it's likely because I put in a typo when I'm typing these things here. <clears throat> now we're not going to bother with any additional custom configuration on this. And we're going to register a desktop application group. Now that's the thing Stephen was saying earlier on about you don't have to publish a full desktop. You can publish an application by which we mean Sage, for example. So you could have Sage running in Azure Virtual Desktop. The user connects to it from their PC and they just see a window with Sage in it, like as if it, as if it was running on their actual PC. There's no visible difference to the user that Sage, alongside all their other windows, is running in Azure. It's, it appears to all intents and purposes like it's running there. But for this, we're going to create a desktop access group. So we're going to create that. <coughs> and now the rest of this, we can pretty much just whiz through it. Uh, I did see the red dot there. I usually forget to pick something on that first page, but it looks like this time I've done it. So we're going to start that creating. So at the moment, we've now submitted the template to Azure. So we're going to see four lines come up in this in a minute. And it's now building our environment. So when I go back to virtual machines here, we'll see there's just what, this one here. But in a minute, we're going to see our new machine will rock up. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are all off and running now. Um, sorry, one second. So, yeah. So while that's while that's happening, um, I'll just sort of talk a bit about a bit more about images. So we had. Well, I was saying a minute ago there. If I go back into Azure Virtual Desktop and host pools, and I just go through the wizard here to create a new one, we can see already the host pool is actually created. By the way, sorry, I'm jumping about a bit here. Yeah, in a minute we will see that machine start coming up. Um, but when I was saying we were creating a pool, I'll just sort of fake this just for a second. So when we pick the image here, as I said, this is not really your your ideal starting point because everybody wants an image that's customized to them. So what we do is we build an image programmatically. That's our ideal. See, a lot of this stuff I'm doing in the portal here generally we shouldn't have to do this because we have our own bespoke scripts that can build an azure avd environment using a set of common defaults that we use so all our clients kind of look the same <coughs> excuse me and uh, you know so for, for typing a few commands and it's literally a dozen we get azure virtual desktop up and running one of the things we do is that is we, we, we create what's called a customized base image so what we would do for that is we take windows 11 
enterprise multi-session in 365 and we create a virtual machine from that. We don't create a pool and it's just a virtual machine. And what we then do is we jump onto it and we start customizing it. So that involves perhaps installing Google Chrome, Firefox, uh, Sage accounts, ArcMap, you know, any, any of your critical line of business tools, the stuff you actually run your business on. Then we prepare that machine, we optimize it. So we take out a lot of stuff in Windows 11 that is just craft that doesn't really have any business being there, but takes all CPU anyway. Things like the Xbox services, which in a business environment, nobody really has any use for, I hope. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we take all that stuff out and we get the image just right. Now, ideally, I just said there about we would install the applications, but ideally we don't want to do that. What we actually want to do is write a script that is customized for each user that says install these applications. And the reason for that is if we have our build process right and automated, we can take that as a template to someone else and save a bit of time. The other thing we can do is we can burn the whole thing at any minute and stand it up from scratch in next to no time at all. And that's a really handy thing. Also, one of the advantages that gives us, if we if we build the image for Windows 10 today and the customer comes to us tomorrow and says, you know, I quite fancy having a shot on Windows 11. It should be a question of us running our scripts again, but changing one parameter to basically say, instead of taking the base image to be Windows 10 with Office 365, take Windows 11 with Office 365. And all things being equal and the software working on Windows 11, as well as it does on Windows 10, you know, compatibility issues, you should be back there and running. <coughs> so it really brings us a lot of flexibility. Um, the number of VMs in the pool, uh, we created just one in this. But once that pool is created, we can add and remove machines from there at any time. So if we decide to ourselves that, um, you know, we, we sized it for five machines, but perhaps you've brought a new application on board, um, you know, and that application is just using a bit more horsepower than expected. Well, we just size up another, we just spin up another machine by adding to the pool. And it really is that simple. I, even though this hasn't finished building yet, I think if I go into this, and look at session hosts. There are none available at the moment, but I could just click add. And I would run through the little wizard again. You can't change these things because these are these are settings for the pool. But here you would just say, I want another two machines and you would get two on it. <laughs> again, Microsoft is changing this constantly. At the moment, you didn't used to be able to extend a pool with a different image. And to be honest, it would be a really bad idea to do it. What you should what it used to do was force you to take the image that you'd built the pool on and just have more of those basically. Um, but they are, they are giving you more flexibility. I think it's a bad idea to be able to change that because it just leads to confusion because now you've got somebody who, as an example, depending on what time of day they log on, gets a Windows 10 or a Windows 11 desktop if you changed it that dramatically. Um, but you can see how easy it is, you know, to change these things once they're there. Likewise, you can turn them off and there's our machine up already. You can see that server is running. So our pool creation is actually getting on here. At, wow, stop the clock. Right, who had who had the time there? <laughs> so let's have a look at this. Creation time, five minutes, one second. Now, and I'm saying, right? Just, just quickly jumping in, you, you passed the test, so thank you very much. Thanks. Well, we haven't logged on to it yet, Stephen. You know, let's let's not get too carried away. <clears throat> but you'll notice the machine is up and running, but it's unavailable. What that status is, yes, the machine is running, but now it's doing all the stuff that makes it a virtual desktop machine. So at the moment, it's now going to run through and jump onto the domain controller. It's going to register with the domain. It will reboot. It will then install the remote desktop services agent and it will reboot after that. So we're going through a configuration phase at the moment. So yes, the machine is running. Yes, I could remote desktop to it if it had a private IP address. Uh, in fact, it does have a private IP address, but um, I'm just not going to jump to it. Uh, we just want to leave it alone for a few minutes and let it sort itself out. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, so the base image, that's the, that's the critical thing. That's where your time goes with Azure Virtual Desktop. As you've seen here, you know, I've pretty much almost got a working virtual desktop environment in five minutes but it's probably useless you know it has office 365 on it and yes i could go to work and i could do that you know i'll get on there in a minute I'll, you know I'll, I'll bring up the web I'll, I'll you know i can start a team's call i can do all these things um but your business is typically a lot more than office 365 um <coughs> excuse me 
So in terms of the pool and the base image, as we start the pool with that with that base that we've configured for your business, you may say in the future, well, we now need this extra piece of software. Now, in an old traditional environment, if you had a, a, a terminal services environment, let's just say you had five hosts and somebody said, right, we now need Sage on all of them. We've decided to use Sage for accounts. I don't work for Sage, by the way. It's just the only thing. It's literally the only application I can think of. Uh, other, other accounting patches are available. And uh, yeah, so if you said, right, we need Sage in the image now, what we would do is we would start a new machine and we would add Sage to the image. Then we would do our little optimization thing. We would shut it down and then we would extend the pool with five new machines and we would block logins to the old one. Or we could uh, roll it out to a UAT pool and just let somebody log on to that to test the application beforehand. We can do that. It's easy to create user acceptance testing things for only a limited subset of users. <clears throat> and then once we're all happy, we've added the machines to the pool based on the new image, we can delete the ones from the old image. We can just get shot of them. And at that point, you've switched over kind of transparently to your users. You know, you do it out of weekends or or whatever, and you know, everything is, is good and great. Um, so at the moment, we're now seeing here, we've got one machine in the pool and zero are unavailable. So I'd like to think that is there. Right, this is the moment of not telling too many lies. Let's see if we can get onto this. So what you're seeing here, this is the remote desktop client that we use to consume the services. Now, what we're seeing here is actually an Azure AD only joined device. This is not the machine that I've just built here. So this is one that I'd be using for testing. So what I'm going to do is subscribe, hopefully using my dynamic dev test account. Uh <laughs> Uh, I spelt that wrong. Yeah, two, two W. Yeah. Phew. Oh, that was a heart stopping moment there. And I'm not going to allow it to do that because I'm getting asked this because uh, that, that account I've been using for Intune testing. So this is why I'm seeing this. <clears throat> and I was going to find nothing because I've forgotten. <laughs> when I when you register the application group, you have to say who gets it, basically. And I didn't assign myself to that. So just exactly as I did yesterday when I was testing, I really don't learn. So I've got a, not VD. That's a totally separate thing. WVD. In case you're wondering why these are all WVD, by the way, Windows Virtual Desktop is what AVD used to be known as. So that's why I still call it WVD half the time, because that's what I kind of learned on. But that's now there, and unfortunately, sometimes it can take a little while <coughs> for that assignment to show up. So I might have to unsubscribe and resubscribe. If you've if you've done that and you've you've kind of jumped in a bit early, it seems a bit reluctant sometimes to, uh, you know, to let you back on. Ugh, let's try it again, shall we? No, just like I said last time. Come on. Ugh. Right, it's going to take a wee while, I think. It's just doing this to annoy me and embarrass me. Right, what I also have, I hope, is the remote desktop web client. Let's see if this gets any better. So that's the one that I'm using for my Dynamic Edge one. I don't want that one. I want... Uh, where did I put it? Too many clients here. Uh, right, okay, so I need to do another window. Just as well, there's so many internet browsers in the world and I need to copy, nope, that one. So let's give this one a try, shall we? Uh, yeah, it can take a while, unfortunately, that assignment part. Let's just try and add myself 
manually just to see if that wakes up. Andrew, would it be worth having a look at the the, the sort of the reporting and the that that's yeah yeah the time to do yeah it. we can, we can go into that. Hopefully, it'll not be too long. But hang on a minute, assign VM. No, that's oh yeah, there's no assign VM. Okay, right, that's fine. Um, yeah. So I'll just sort of bring up a quick presentation on t in terms of what the reporting looks like while we're waiting for that to to sort its life out. Um. Nothing worse than when you've got people watching. Totally fine yesterday. <clears throat> so these are some sample um, reports from some of our various customers. Um, as you can see, this one's from a small size client. There's approximately seven users generally. They only have one host available. Um, <clears throat> and this just tells us, you know, the machines that are available, how, what their sort of scale is and, and, you know, how many users are having issues connecting. Now, this is connection diagnosis. I can't remember what the window was for this. I think it was four hours or something like that. Yeah, that looks about right. Um, the, the, the monitoring portal gives you a lot of great information. So you look at this, you go, wow, big red errors there. But when you actually dig into it, authentication log on failed. That's a little snapshot from the logs that it would show me on one of the other pages. I can't actually show you the pages for these clients because, of course, they're client specific. Um, but basically, this red line means the user typed their password wrong. That's what that is. So when you know when a user's phoning in with issues, you can learn a lot of really great stuff from this in terms of um, you know what version of the Windows Virtual Desk, as your virtual desktop client they're using. If they're on a Mac or a PC, did they type their password in wrong? Um, you know, did they get kicked off perhaps because their home broadband had an issue? You know, it's great for diagnosing things like that. <clears throat> we get a quick look at the performance statistics of that single host. So even though there's seven users on here, we're using about less than 50% of the memory. And out of their four cores on that machine, that looks like they're peaking at about 25%. Now we've the user, this particular client, we've you know we've said to them we don't need this spec of machine. We could actually lower it, but they were like, no, let's just keep it in case, in case we need it. So they are aware that they're essentially, you know, throwing away a few quid here, but they're they're okay. You know, they're doing all right. Um, Here's the number of sessions that they're having. So you can see them all ramping up from nine in the morning. This isn't 40 and 20, by the way. This is all zeros and that's 0, 0.0 and 2.0. For some reason, it decides to put a, a decimal point on the scale because it averages it, I think. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Again, we can see the CPU history here. It looks as though we're averaging about 10%. Even during the working hours, your main hours of nine, you know, we're, we're never really peaking. We've got a medium sized client. So they have a, generally about 40 users on on five hosts and we've set these we've scaled these machines so that they can get about 11 people on comfortably comfortably before things start to deteriorate a little bit. And we're always trying to guard against that deterioration. So you can see here that prod four has 11 users, prod two has 11 users, prod one has 10. And the fact that prod zero is up shows us that at one point, there probably were 11 on this, so it had to start another machine. The user has since logged off that, so that's why we have four machines up. But if you look down here, prod three hiding a bit, it says it's unavailable. So that machine is powered off because Azure Virtual Desktop has decided that we really don't need to bring that on right now. So we're saving the customer money by having that turned off. And again, if we were to get a sudden influx of an extra user on there and another five on there, as soon as another user comes on on top of that, prod three would spring to life. Um, <clears throat> this is again some of their connection ones and we can see the times they connect. Again, a lot of this is users just putting the wrong password in. It's it's amazing how many users do that. Um, this is uh, our, again, the, the same as we were looking at before. This is the blue line is memory and the red line is CPU. So you can see here the blue line's getting quite close to the top for memory. And you might think, oh, do we not need to add another machine? That's running very close. Well, I always describe free memory as wasted memory. If you've got free memory, you don't need it. You know, there's no point in building a, a 128 gigabyte computer for your home PC if all you ever do is, is you know, run Word and Photoshop. You're, you're wasting it, basically. Um, we've seen a bit of a burst of activity here that's of a bit of concern in the disk timings. Uh, so I would probably, if the user were complaining, that would be a great time to go in and dial in, uh, dig in rather than find out just exactly what was going on at the half 12. Could be that somebody ran some scan for emails or whatever. You know, I don't know whatever users do. Um, 
again, we're seeing sort of history here and a session history and users per core. So here we're getting roughly three users per core. What that means is the machines, we have five machines, they have four cores in each, so 20 cores. So we're getting on this client an average of about three users per core. That's pretty industry average from what I see in some of the, the, the channels I lurk for, for Azure Virtual Desktop. But what we can see down here, <clears throat> rather worryingly, is that blue line, which is WVD Prod 1, flatlined at 100% for a few minutes. And that box is above it with the yellow thing in it. We, because of our custom alerting, we have things that can send alerts to our call logging system. If something is sustainably bad, it can get a, a call logged in uh, ConnectWise and one of our, our technicians will pick it up. But what it also does, even if it's just a small blip for a while, those actually go, those alerts actually go to Teams and it goes into a channel specifically for that client and it tells me there's a dynamic performance alert and I should, you know, it's, it's not something to go and investigate straight away because it might just be something that only lasted for a couple of minutes. As you can see, it didn't seem to last for more than about half an hour, which might seem like a lot, but maybe the user was, you know, running something, you know, that, that guaranteed to use all that CPU up, you know, and that's, that's they've just used it basically. Um, it's maybe not a big problem. Uh, and now we have a larger size client. This is approximately 60 users with the four hosts. So in the previous one, we had 40 users and five. Now we've got 60 and four. The difference here is this client they don't really use Office 365. They tend to use most of their stuff in uh, Google services like Google Drive and Google Docs and things like that. So here you can see we've sized approximately 18 users, whereas the other one was 11. And these are exactly the same specification of host machine. So that's, you know, this is all just, you can sit and look at the figures every day and you can run through the sizing calculators and say, are you a normal user, a heavy user or a power user or a light user? But until you actually start using it, you don't really know what kind of user you are, to be honest. If Yeah, if you spend all day in Photoshop, we'll call you a heavy user. But the different, you know, I would have said a light user was somebody who used Office and 365, you know, Office 365, but it turns out that will put you actually up more towards power user uh, in terms of the calculator. So again, here we're seeing their connection results. Um, a lot of this, uh, again, it's probably passwords. Uh, you know, there's uh, that's most, most commonly the sort of thing. Um, and here we're seeing the CPU and, you know, the, the history for memory and stuff like that. So they're getting a bit more towards about 70% memory. The CPU is more than fine. So I wouldn't say that's kind of no problem at all, really. Uh, and here we're seeing the connection history and the, and the CPU usage history. Everything's looking pretty healthy at that client. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so this is the demo I ran through yesterday, the one we just saw did it in five minutes. Yesterday it took seven minutes and 39. So for whatever reason, uh, Azure deployments are going a little bit faster today than they did yesterday. So that's a bit strange. Um, the other thing, and this is just a sort of a final thing here, is that we don't always have to do this through the through the portal. Everything I did in the portal there, where I went through the little wizard with the five pages, yes, I want to register a desktop. Yes, I want to add five machines. Yes, I want them to be this. We can do that with this two lines. This first one just grabs a credential and the second one says create the pool. And all the other information that we need in there, like which domain it would join, so not which domain, uh, which specification of machine, which image it was using, that comes from our defaults. So the way our scripts work is they, they have a good set of defaults. So you can specify minimum information going from each one to each one. Generally, it's never more than credentials where credentials are needed. And at that point, you know, you've you've got a working as your virtual desktop. So that's sort of, sort of some of the monitoring stuff there. So let's just see if by any chance that thing is now uh, showing up, and I really hope it is. Ah, oh, phew! Can't tell you how, how relieved I am to see that. <coughs> right. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, okay, let's try and log in as your virtual desktop. You notice this says sessions. I haven't changed the names, I haven't changed the, the group names, anything like that yet. So. I've just left them on the defaults. This is all just icing. I just want to make sure it works. Ah, oh, I've forgotten to do this every time. Right, the reason the screen's gone black is I have three monitors and Azure Virtual Desktop is fantastic. It'll use those three monitors. And unfortunately, my desktop's coming up on my laptop, which is the screen I'm not sharing at the moment. So we'll just wait till the desktop actually arrives and then I'll show you something that's actually quite cool. Just give me a moment. Right, so let me just. Right, OK, so that's my right left hand monitor now. So what I can do with this is I can fit the session to the window. 
So now you can see that's my three monitors. That, that's not much use, is it? So what I'm going to change in here, a single display when windowed, and then I have to maximise this again, because it's a bit of a fur. <coughs> and then I do it like this, and then it's resized back to one monitor without me logging off or on. This is a pretty cool thing you can do in Azure Virtual Desktop, is if you scale the window, it'll just redraw it at the right size. It's, it's actually kind of quite nice. Now, I'm really going to tempt fate here and see how this works. AVD Media Optimized. OK, uh, let's try this. So as Stephen mentioned earlier on, in a traditional remote desktop services environment, we've pretty much had to tell people, look, don't do video conferencing in Teams. It's not going to work. All the horsepower, the encoding and decoding of video and audio happens on the terminal server and you will leather the machine. Your, 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 your colleagues who are on the same server won't thank you for it. And that's how this used to work in Azure Virtual Desktop as well. But what they've done is they have Teams and Zoom offloading the video and the audio encoding to your client computer. So now, if I go into this, so now you're looking at me on Azure Virtual Desktop. These are my speaker devices. It's my microphone, and unfortunately for you, that's me. So you're kind of seeing this with lag. Now, to me, they're looking at that. That looks pretty quick, but I don't know what sort of lag this is because you're, because of course, what you're watching is me sending my video to Azure Virtual Desktop, Azure Virtual Desktop sending that image back to me, then I'm sending it to Teams, to go on the meeting and you're downloading it from Teams. So it's all over the place twice. So to give you an idea of what sort of lag, and bear in mind, you know, we, we, we're really in the worst situation here. I don't know, is that is that like really far behind or what's it look like? No, it actually looks quite good, Andrew. Yeah, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're absolutely seeing your mouth move at the, at the timing that you're speaking. So I think that's quite impressive, actually. Yeah, I'm just glad that I remembered to get dressed today. So anyway, <laughs> OK, I'll turn that off. <clears throat> so that's us now working. This is an Azure Virtual Desktop, and I can maximise this. We can get, oh no, I'm going back to three screens. One second, I must have hit the wrong one. I thought I'd turn that off. And display settings, single display when windowed. <clears throat> ah, when windowed, of course, no. Yeah, so when I when I maximise that, of course, it's going back to three screens. Um, you can sort of fiddle it about so that, it's, you know, it doesn't do that. But uh, yeah, so here we have the working system. <coughs> <coughs> oh. All right, yes, sorry, this is the new version of Edge. For a second there, I thought it was the old one. So that's a bit strange. Uh, right, so you've got all your applications. Unfortunately, if I start Word and the likes of that, because this is a development environment, I don't have any licenses there, so I'll just get moaned at. But let's just go into this, focus, confirm, confirm, and we'll just go to. <coughs> oh, right, yep. Yeah. So, you know, everything here kind of works and performs pretty rapidly. And hopefully, again, if you're seeing a lot of starters, remember that you're also at the mercy of this information going up to Azure and back and up to Azure and, and up to the cloud and back for you to, you know, for you to see it. So for me, this is perfectly acceptable. This is, you know, local computer performance. Um, so you've got Word there. Uh, so yeah, that's all kind of nice and simple. It's just a desktop and it just works. You know, there's not really a lot to show you once it's up and running. But there are some really cool things that you get because it's in Azure. So I'll show you the first thing here. We're all familiar with broadband at home and it's, you know, speeds and capabilities and things like that. So I can't remember what the UK average now, oops, uh, uh, for home broadband speed is, but, you know, I, I would guess it's in the region of 40 megabit or something like that. I get about 50 here, I think it is. In fact, you can actually find out from this what speed you're getting. So here, my latency. In other words, the time to get to Azure and back is 36 milliseconds. When that goes above about 100, you'll notice it. And it's saying my available bandwidth is 39, right? So we've got a little speed check in there. That's always handy from a support point of view. <clears throat> but you can see here, what this is doing is this just went, this fast.com, it always is a speed test to the internet. Because I'm in Azure there, I'm getting 1.4 gigabits per second. 
So I've gone from 40 in the house to 1400 in the cloud. So why is that important? Is it just because you can have, you know, BBC load a little bit quicker? No. All these things that you, the, the internet services that you depend on and don't really think about, like Office 365, you know, you're not going to get your email any faster. But things like OneDrive, things like SharePoint, things like Dropbox, Google Drive, all these other, all these things that might take a while to happen on your PC if you're at home or if you're in the office on a congested link, suddenly you've increased your internet speed for your desktop tenfold, you know, twentyfold, whatever. So these things suddenly become a lot more responsive and a lot more usable. And you may find that using internet services as opposed to shared drives is suddenly a lot more viable, let's call it, or a, a lot more usable. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, excuse me, God, this cough. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of some of the differences there. In terms of terminal services as well, if you had a pool with a tr traditional five terminal servers, you have to back them up because that's the machines that your users depend to get on in the morning. With Azure Virtual Desktop, any of these machines has a problem. So say, for example, I have a pool with AVD host zero to five. So we've got six machines. And one day, for whatever reason, host four won't start. Now, in a traditional terminal services environment, if you had five machines, you obviously you probably needed five machines. And if one machine won't start, then you're into a recovery position. You either fix the machine or you restore it from the last good backup. And you have to back these up because you know they're the things that run your business. With Azure Virtual Desktop, we don't back up Azure Virtual Desktop. We, back, we have a backup of the image. So if this goes wrong and AVD host four doesn't start tomorrow morning, I don't waste my time looking at it. I just delete it and I add another host to the pool. So you remove that one, you add a new one. What's the point in trying to fix something you can replace? These machines should be classed as totally disposable. That's how we try to work this. So once we've got our base image, we don't even have to waste time creating, the, you know, deploying the base image again and making the customization again. We save the base image. So all we do is to say, right, right, um, you know, as your resource manager, bin that one, give me a new one in its place. And that saves you a lot of time. <coughs> so it's not just for the ease of deployment, it's the ease of maintenance, let's call it. Um, Andrew, do you mind if I just jump in very quickly, if that's okay? Because sure. I'm, I'm, I'm super conscious on time. Um, oh, that, sorry. That, that, no, no, listen, don't apologise. And I think it's absolutely amazing because I know for a fact that you could continue on for the next three hours and still be giving us some oh, really interesting and, and, and really useful things um, for us to, to, to talk about. There's a couple of things that I picked up on just as you were going through the presentation there. I think it's really great that you showed the administration side of things to show people what, what we can do for them, the flexibility that we can give that bit you touched on at the end there about you know what we'll just bin it and create another one because we can scale and we can adapt and we can get users on really really quickly as well the other point was just that end user experience and i talked about that as being one of the concerns in the presentation so the end user experience if we're giving people a virtual desktop to use that is giving them 1.4 gigabits per second of speed to the internet that, that's groundbreaking you know that's really just going to increase the productivity and increase what, what basically our, our workforce can do with us mm -hmm. um Andy Wilson, sitting in the background. Andy, um, do you have um, any questions very quickly in the next couple of minutes um, that that we that Andrew or I can answer? Uh, and Brian, I think if you just stop the presentation, that'd be great. But Andy, is there any questions there? Thanks, Stephen. And again, thank you, Andrew, for the for the demonstration. It was very, very good. So, um, majority of the questions. And again, thank you for for everyone that was that was asking them. Um, the majority of the questions I managed to get answered absolutely fine. There was. Uh, uh, one here from uh, anonymous, but um, uh, probably one for yourself, um, Andrew. Is it is it possible to use autopilot or Intune uh, to deploy applications um, to the the VMs when they you know after they after they spin up? Uh, yes, you can. So if you, as I said earlier on, you have at the moment there's still that dependency for an Active Directory domain. <clears throat> but what you can do is you can do what's called a hybrid join. So you can have them in Active Azure Active Directory and Active Directory enrolled in Intune. And from there, you can deploy uh, applications via Intune. The, um, when you actually go to deploy a host pool in Azure Active Directory only, one of the options you get is, do you want to register this in Intune? 
So it, it's designed really a, a bit like Windows 365, actually. Windows 365 is very heavily dependent on this is enrolled in Intune. So yeah, you can deploy things like that. We also deploy software using a package manager called Chocolatey, which makes things you know quite easy. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different ways to get software on, but ideally, what you kind of there's um, there's other things you can do as well. Like you can you can have a base image with the software isn't in it, but you can make software appear via something called MSIX App Attach, where you would package. Let's just say Sage. Uh, oh, bad idea, Sage though. Um, but you would package Sage and you just say like attach this to the people in the finance department. So it's not in the image, but it appears as though it is. It just appears on their start menu and they use it. And that's kind of a, a quite a, a, a useful technology as well. Brilliant. Hope that answers the question. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. And and um, we have unfortunately run out of time today. Um, you know, I'm very conscious that everyone's got, got things to be getting on with today. But thank you so much to everyone who has joined the webinar today. I really hope you found it interesting. I certainly have. And from a business development point of view for myself, you know, when I'm going out there and talking to clients and talking with prospects about things like Azure Virtual Desktop, it's really reassuring for me to know that there is someone with Andrew's skills sitting in the background that can deliver these projects um, and can deliver it in a way where we can actually really focus on the client requirement, focus on what it is for your business that we need and, and do a solution design based around everything that you need. So thank you again for everyone. If there are any questions that we haven't managed to answer, we will absolutely get back to you. There will also be a recording of this webinar. So if you do want to watch it back, um, my colleague Bryony will be putting that up there on our uh, YouTube channel and uh, so we'll share that round with you and also please keep an eye out for future webinars as well. We'd love for you to join us uh, and learn some more about the, the services that we can offer you. So thank you very much. Have a great day everyone and speak to you all again soon. Thank you.